Thank you. Um, so we'll skip over that one. And we've seen this map before, and uh, the point to draw out of this is where the wind resources are and where the um, transmission system is. <clears throat> the transmission system being in the black and the intense wind resources in the red that you can see in the map extends offshore and hence the, the broad margin of red around the southern coasts. The problem is that, as you can see from that map, that as, as we've heard, that where our wind resources are isn't necessarily where all of our people live. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, as we heard earlier, um, some people don't like small wind turbines in the neighbour's backyard, let alone big ones. So I'll come back and talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, why is wind an important renewable resource to be considered in Australia and, and indeed globally, but particularly in Australia? Um, more recently, uh, about a month ago, the federal government, uh, with the support of the opposition in the Senate, uh, passed a law that requires uh, retailers of electricity in Australia now to, by 2020, be providing around 20% of their energy in the form of renewables. It's called the Renewable Energy Target. Um, and we've had one of these before in Australia. Um, it was around 2%. Um, the next target is an increase such that around 40,000 gigawatt hours of energy supplied by retailers in Australia by 2020 needs to come from new renewables. Some of you may buy a product called Green Power from one of the retailers. Any renewables that sits within Green Power is over and above this target. So making choices to buy Green Power at an individual level will require people to install more renewables beyond the target levels. What I wanted to draw out, though, is the size of this challenge. Um, if I can work out where the pointer goes. This dark red bar here is the requirement for new renewables. The lighter red is the existing renewable targets and existing hydro in the system. Looking below that, though, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute, we have two other bars related to gas, and I'll explain why, th why they are there. If most of the new renewable target was met by wind, that would require around 7,000 megawatts of new wind turbines to be developed over the next decade. That would mean roughly around 100 megawatts is a big wind turbine. So the ones up at Hallett or down at Lake Bonney in South Australia, typically in the stages they've been built are around 50 to 100 megawatts. That means seven of those a year. And over the decade, between now and 2020, it's around 15 to $20 billion of investment. That's a large amount of money for, uh, I think, in anyone's terms. Importantly, though, um, as we heard earlier, the wind doesn't blow all the time. And while we've got good availability in Australia, particularly on the southeastern um, seaboard and, and areas inland from there, um, where we might have availabilities of 35, possibly as high as 40%, Nevertheless, that means that somewhere between 60 to 65% of the time, the wind's not blowing. And while in the future we may have technologies like um, flywheels and so forth to back that up, in the near term, we don't. So in our view, and I say ours being Origin's view, um, the ideal way to back that wind up through the grid is with gas. And the ideal way to do it with gas um, is with gas peaking plant. The benefit of that sort of plant is you can turn it on and have it ramp up to full load in a matter of uh, tens of minutes, whereas coal-fired stations, unless they're running, take a long time to ramp up, many, many hours, possibly a full day, and that's not very good if the wind is fluctuating. The other thing, though, that's going to be needed in the future is new transmission to bring the wind resources from those distant areas today which are relatively sparsely populated to the areas where we all live. Um, so we're not only talking about 7,000 megawatts of wind and other renewables, we're also talking about the need to add more gas uh, generation, open cycle, to back that up. And it, whether it's uh, Origin's view or AGL's view, the numbers may differ, but we both agree that we need uh, more gas peaking plant. 
And then we need the transmission system to be augmented, um, added to in major ways to bring that power from those distant um, high-grade renewable resources to where we live. It's really no different to what we did as a society when we built large coal-fired plant on the coal mines and shipped the power to where we live. So in South Australia we have Northern Power Station up at Port Augusta and we all live down in Adelaide, so there are very large systems to bring that power from Port Augusta down to Adelaide. I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's talk about the question of the wind blowing or not and why it's important to back the wind up. Um, in South Australia, um, I think it was last summer, um, what we saw was on our hottest day, um, through the early morning, the wind was blowing. That's this part of the curve. However, as the day went on, and we have several hundred megawatts of wind in South Australia, as the day went on, what we saw was the wind fell away. And this was the hottest part of the day. It's probably uh, looking at this, you know, between four and eight o'clock at night. And the problem was with the wind falling away, um, this other line is the electricity price that people buying in the spot market would have had to pay for electricity on that day. Now, no, none of us as uh, retail customers have to pay that price. We get our supply from a retailer, Origin, AGL and others. The problem is that the retailer has to see ways of covering this price risk. And hence it's not surprising that companies like us and AGL will be installing gas-fired plant because that gives us the surety that although society requires more renewables, on the day when the wind isn't blowing, for example, and people are running their air conditioners, we can meet our supply obligations to customers. Um, but it is a challenge for us um, and for us as a community uh, as we go forward in the increase the amount of wind in the system. It'll mean that we'll need more gas capacity in the system as well to supply the instantaneous gas requirements on the days that, that the wind isn't blowing and demand is high. And this picture just shows uh, one view, it's, it's Origin's view of what happens to gas demand in Victoria each month through a year. So you can see in the winter months the gas daily demand is higher than it might be in the summer and it varies. And it, the graph changes in the latter part because this is by year uh, picking up these peaks. And what we see is that today in Victoria we've got a, a peak gas availability running through that grey line, but as the demand for more peaking plant is likely to increase as the wind resources are developed in Victoria, we see that in all likelihood there will need to be an augmentation of gas capacity. Similarly, um, this next graph looks at the transmission systems and their capacity to handle more injection of um, uh, generation into those systems. So um, perhaps to pick up one example, um, South Australia today uh, with the dark red line is indicating that the transmission systems in South Australia are starting to hit against limits for ability to absorb more wind. Now South Australia is very well placed in terms of its wind resource, particularly as you go further west onto Air Peninsula. Um, the problem is that there isn't a strong transmission system to bring the power from that area to where we live. But more particularly, not just the million or so that live in Adelaide, um, why not export more of that power to the eastern seaboard? Um, and the difficulty is that the main connection link to the eastern seaboard would top out in terms of its capacity to move power uh, if we were to fully develop our wind potential. And so there will be opportunities for um, augmentation and, and major development of transmission systems as well. As I said earlier, that's not that different to what we did when we developed coal-fired plant because we built large transmission systems to move the power from the energy sources to where the people live. And in many respects, because um, with large-scale wind developments, um, they are visually um, noticeable, um, no one can deny that, um, it generally makes it easier to permit and develop those where there are less people and where the wind resource is good. So South Australia is ideally placed, but there needs to be um, augmentation to the transmission system for power. 
gas, the plant for gas can be in the cities, um, but not um, typically the wind. I'm going to switch stories now and talk a little bit about photovoltaics and, and solar power. Not the hot water from our hot water systems that sit on roofs and look black, but increasingly from those black little square things that you see on panels that sit on rooftops that generate electricity directly from the sunlight. Um, historically, over the last um, two decades in particular, the solar PV business um, has been growing at a rate where it, the total um, production capacity each year is doubling every two to three years. So their growth rates of 30 to 40 percent a year compound uh, year on year for two decades. The solar cells are manufactured ma mainly from silicon, uh, high purity silicon. Um, the technologies, although there are new technologies around, in the main haven't changed that much over the last 20 years. But what's got a lot better is people's capacity to make them cheaply. Um, so as we build more cars, uh, we produce them cheaper. It happens with all manufactured goods, um, typically. And what we find with solar panels is that they've got cheaper year on year as demand has grown. Um, that demand growth has been accelerated by policies of governments, initially in Japan with things called feed laws. Uh, then they moved into Europe and accelerated the development of solar in Europe and industries that um, manufacture solar panels and provide the technology and the resources and the installation and everything else. Very large numbers of jobs created. Um, and that is now being applied in other Asian countries, China, Korea, uh, to name just a couple, and, and as we see now in Australia. And as a result of that in Australia, we're seeing a large uptake in um, solar panels on rooftops. If you went back five years ago, you could walk around suburbs and, and not see one solar panel on a rooftop. Today, you walk down most streets and you'll see someone has solar on their roof. So in terms of price, today that's assisted by feed laws where um, some incentive is paid effectively to people to put them on their rooftops and that cost of that incentive is spread across all other electricity consumption. Over time though, um, what has happened as the demand has burgeoned for um, PV is that manufacturing costs have reduced dramatically. Um, so over the last two decades, uh, costs have halved roughly each decade for the cost of a photovoltaic module. And it doesn't sort of take too much imagination to think, well, what might that look like in 10 years' time? And what it might look like is that uh, costs have come down again by half. Um, at some point, that curve will flatten out. But um, coming down again by half would probably put uh, PV um, on most people's rooftops economically relative to the marginal cost of buying more power off the grid. Now that presents a whole number of uh, additional challenges for traditional network supply businesses in electricity because our grids historically have been designed to take the power from a central area and distribute it out at lower and lower voltages to where we all use it. Once we start having distributed generation, then we need to have smarter grids that can manage and smarter people managing the grids that, and, and probably a lot more computers that can manage this ebb and flow of electricity through our grid system uh, as we have more distributed sources, still with the concentrated sources um, making uh, energy through days and through nights. The other sort of solar power which I won't talk about is derived from concentrated solar power systems and I'm sure we'll cover that later with another speaker. Um, my bottom line, I guess, is can these things make a difference? Uh, there are regulations that will require that we do some things differently. Um, I think the answer is yes, they can make a difference, and it's a big difference. We need to make big steps to achieve these differences on a material scale, and that's partly what the change in the renewable law is about, partly what the feed law is about, is to drive those costs down and push more renewable, lower emission intensive energy into our systems. Can it make a difference? Yes, it can. Um, the climate group this week, I think it was, issued a report on um, uh, the last uh, year's emissions out of Australia's power plants uh, around Australia on each of the mainland states on the national electricity market. South Australia came in at about 0.64 tonnes on average 
of CO2 per megawatt hour generated with our mix of coal, gas and wind. Uh, if one was to contrast that with Victoria, uh, they have more brown coal clearly and less wind uh, and some gas but not a lot. Uh, Victoria came in at 1.15 tonnes per megawatt hour. So with the combination of gas, wind and albeit some coal, in South Australia we're achieving generation with a substantially lower carbon footprint than, than what is possible uh, from higher fossil fuel based um, technologies. So perhaps that's a sign of the future of what we can aspire to across Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat and we'll um, just continue the discussion. <coughs> Before the, um, uh, just to keep on time, I think I'll ask you perhaps one and uh, maybe two questions. Um, you mentioned gas as uh, an alternative to actually supplement the wind energy. Uh, and it's fair to assume that um, uh, the highest uh, peak in, in electricity demand is when the sun is quite hot enough. Why don't we use solar uh, as a supplement to wind? So we could do, um, and possibly concentrated solar plants would provide that um, option as well in the future, I think. But um, today, and, and and the decade we have ahead of us, um, the beauty about gas, I guess, is that when it runs, it doesn't need to run a long time because it's that peak is a relatively short peak um, and it's relatively cost efficient to do it today. So uh, large companies tend to make decisions based on economics and today gas is the best answer. It may be that solar thermal in the future might be the best answer or in a future where we have um, 30 or 40 percent of the households have got PV on their roofs, then if the wind doesn't blow, maybe that's a good thing because they're generating their own power. Let me follow this up again. Uh, Eight percent uh, uh, of our electricity is generated from natural gas. Um, and apparently if we switch to 100 percent, we only got 15 years to go of the total. Shouldn't we be reserving this for processes which require high temperature and natural gas and use it for electricity? Um, I, think, I think those arguments have been put in the past. Um, in fact, I was living, I think, in Victoria at the time when uh, those arguments were around Newport Power Station. Um, Victoria has not run out of gas in the last 20 years. I think more importantly, though... Uh, we, we don't know what the actual reserve is, is it? We do or we don't. I mean, Origin is clearly involved, as are other companies, in developing uh, new forms of gas in coal seams, uh, in extracting that and potentially putting that into large LNG plants that will export many times the domestic consumption of gas in Australia. Likewise, uh, in Western Australia, um, with projects like the Gorgon project recently approved and under development, these are, Australia has very, very large gas resources, both conventional and unconventional. Um, a few years ago, North America was running out of gas and then they found out that they could extract gas from um, shale, or, uh, shale, underground rock. Today, North America, um, gas prices in North America have halved because of that gas technology now being developed. And we haven't even looked really seriously in Australia at what that potential might be. So I, I don't think we're going to run out of gas anytime soon. OK, that's very optimistic. Um, <laughs> Just one small question, and then you mentioned that we need to upgrade the transmission lines. Who do you think should pay for it? Um, well, at the end of the day, I guess, uh, whether it's governments or private sector that install these things, uh, I think in our economy, generally, either the taxpayer or consumers pay. So um, one way or another, those people that generally use um, the things that uh, uh, we buy and so on are the people that pay. Please join me thanking Andrew. We, we'll have time for questions.